Well, good evening, and thank you again for um, joining in um, with our studies, our, our walk through Deuteronomy, our, our quick walk through Deuteronomy. And before we get into what we're looking at this evening, as always, I'm going to pray for us and ask that God would speak to us as we look into His Word and that we might understand more about Him and what He calls us to. One of the things in prayer is it, it's also a great time for us to, to settle our hearts, to hear His voice. So let's take some time and do that together just now. Let's, let's pray. Father, would you be pleased to help us to be still, help us to hear amid all the distractions and concerns, the worries about what's happening around about us. Father, we, we remember that moment on the sea where the disciples were so taken and worried about everything that was going on around about them. And your son simply spoke peace to the troubled waters and the waves and hushed them to stillness. Father, as we in the midst of these times are so concerned about what lies ahead us, ahead of us in the weeks or the months as has been suggested, would you allow us in this moment together as we turn our attention toward your word to have our gaze fixed upon you. Would you allow us to find in who you are, the unchanging one, the rock of refuge, something stable and solid, one who is unchanging, unlike the times around about us, that we may find rest for our souls, that we might find comfort and security that we might find in you one who is unchanging, eternal, ever the same. And Father, in you that we might find a comfort that is overflowing like a fountain. Father, for those of us who may be tempted to stay at a distance away from you, would you afresh cause to be displayed before us and within our hearts, bring to our remembrance the good news concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, that one has come who has dealt with our rebellion, who has dealt with our sin, who has dealt with our failures, who has taken the curse, who was cast outside, as it were, that we might be brought in. Father, even if the evil one himself is pointing out our stains and our failures, would you by your Spirit remind us of the power of the blood of your Son, that we can with confidence draw close to you. So Father, help us as we look into your Word now to see something of the loveliness of the Gospel, to see our Redeemer, our Savior, to understand some of these things which at first sight seem confusing to us but in the light of your Son and His cross. They just make sense. Help us to see these things and be with us by your Spirit to build your church. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapters 31 and 32. That's the, the plan for this next wee while together. And as you're, you're turning there, um, I want to present you with a a question of sorts which will erupt from these two chapters, and that is what is what do you view as your purpose being in in life? What, what do you think God has called you to? Th these chapters will answer that question for us. I think I remember once visiting a, a Christian in hospital, and he the question that he presented to me was, I don't know what my purpose is in life. And that question has stayed with me, that statement has stayed with me throughout these years because it's so sad that a follower of Christ is not aware of the purpose, the calling that we have, because 
in some respects, as we read the Scriptures, as we'll see this evening, I trust, it's, it's unmistakable what you and I are called to as children of the living God, and, and that will come out of these passages together. But as we get to Deuteronomy 31 and 32, we're approaching the end part of Moses' farewell speech to the people of Israel as, as they stand on the very border of the promised land, which has opened up before them, and God is going to lead them into it. And this is Moses kind of rounding off the last words that he has to say to them. I, I grant you that Deuteronomy is a very um, long farewell speech of sorts, but as we've seen on our way through it, it's, it's just packed with the goodness of God and His vision for what they're going to be like in the promised land. And as he gets to the, the end here in Deuteronomy 31 and 32, we're reminded that Moses is not going to cross over with them. Way back at the beginning of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse 27, we read these words, Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift up your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward, and look at it with your eyes, for you shall not go over this Jordan. So Moses is being reminded by God because of his disobedience, he's not going to be allowed to go into the promised land. He can look at it, but he will not go in and set foot on it, at least not at this point in time. Years later, he actually does set foot on it. And remember the transfiguration with Christ where Moses and Elijah appear, and he actually gets to stand within the promised land. But in this life here, it, it was not allowed. However, Moses was given this charge way back in Deuteronomy chapter 3. But charge Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, for he shall go over at the head of this people, and he shall put them in possession of the land you shall see. So, so Moses is called by God. You can look at the land, you will not go over, but what you are to do is you're to take Joshua, install him as the leader of God's people, and you're to encourage him and strengthen him. And what we're going to see in Deuteronomy 31 and, and 32, that is what Moses is doing here. He's installing Joshua as the new leader in front of God's people and over God's people, and he's strengthening him and encouraging him. And these chapters include that charge being fulfilled by Moses. But it's also so much more than just that, as we're actually going to see together. There is something that erupts from chapter 31 that challenges us. Uh, th there's parts of chapter 31 that are, are so well known in Christian circles. There, there's two verses in particular that you'll often find on, on like mugs or posters or whatever, because we draw so much comfort from them, and that's right. Yet there's another verse that presents this, th this challenge. It almost, two verses cause your heart to soar and one verse caused your heart to almost stall in the midst of the soaring. So, we'll look at them together. Uh, I'll present the problem in this text, and then we'll look at the answer that's also given within this text. So, there's, there's a problem, and there's a solution that's given to us all in this one portion of Scripture. But first of all, the encouragement. And what we read first of all is that Moses speaks to all of Israel. So, Deuteronomy 31 and verse 1 to verse 6 reads like this. So, Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them, and Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you and shall do to them according to the whole commandment I have commanded you. Now here comes the, the famous verse. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. 
So here the, all the people of Israel are commanded. You're going to go over into the promised land. Joshua is going to lead you. But here's the thing. Don't be afraid. And don't be in dread of the people in the land in front of you. And the wonderful thing about Scripture is it, it never just tells you don't be afraid. It, it always gives you a reason. Don't be afraid. Here's the reason why. And the reason that the people of Israel were not to be afraid or in dread of what was in front of them is simple. The Lord your God goes with you. He will go before you. He will be with you. And he says he will not leave you or forsake you. So there's this notion of, well, you don't need to be afraid because God is with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. So why on earth are you going to be afraid of anything? Even in days like ours, when we're not sure what next week is going to bring or, or next month is going to bring, or in the midst of this global pandemic, the thing about the followers of God is there's no reason to be afraid. There's no reason to be in dread because our God is with us. He will not leave us or forsake us, and we can draw great encouragement from this. So fear should be dispelled. And Moses is speaking to the people here, saying, don't be afraid. Don't be in dread, because God goes with you. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. This is so encouraging for them and still for us today. Then the attention switches from the people to Joshua, verse 7. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. And it's similar promises that are now given to Joshua. He's now been placed in leadership over all these people. And all the questions that would have risen up in his mind and in his heart, am I, am I qualified for this? Will I know what I'm supposed to be doing, when I'm supposed to be doing it? I've got to take these people into the land. Um, what exactly am I supposed to do when I get in there? How is this all going to work? There's so many different reasons that could have caused Joshua to be afraid, to be dismayed, and yet Moses' encouragement to him is, no, no, don't be afraid, don't be in dread, be strong and courageous. Why? The Lord goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So, so again, Joshua is being encouraged with the same things. God is with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. Don't be afraid. Everything here speaks of encouragement. Uh, at this point, what happens next is Moses, after encouraging the people about the presence of God, the fact that he will not leave them or forsake them, Moses writes out a copy of the law. And the basic idea is here, every seven years in the year of the Sabbath, when slaves were released and land was returned and that sort of thing was going on, every seven years, all of Israel would be gathered together. All of them, men, women, boys and girls, everybody would be gathered together before God at the temple. And at that point, what the priests would do is they would take the law that had been written down by Moses and they would read it to everyone, everyone, the, the men, the women, the children, all of them. And then at least once every seven years, every single person in Israel would be reminded of the law. So, so Moses writes it down for them. He, he gives it to the Levites to put beside the ark. Now, the, the assumption here or the, the hint is the people may forget the law. Why else would you say that every seven years, at least, the whole thing would be read to the people and it would be explained to them so that they could walk in the fear of the Lord and be reminded of all the commandments, all the law? The hint is they're going to forget. Now, you would think that the people of God 
aren't going to get the Word of God wrong. It's not like the people of God are going to forget the Word of God, is it? Well, you go forward a few generations when they're in the land, and they end up with this king called Josiah. A young kid becomes king, and he looks at the temple where God's presence is supposed to be, and he decides it needs a bit of a renovation. It's just been left. It's, it's not looking good. It's a bit of a mess. So, so he gets the workmen in to look after the temple. And I guess well, you know, you, one way or another, maybe they, they fall through a wall or something like that, and they find this book, and they give the book to the high priest. So the high priest has a wee look at the book, and then he gives it to Josiah's secretary. And the secretary brings it to Josiah, saying, look, they're, they're working in the temple there, And they found this book. So he starts reading the book for Josiah. And what it turns out is that this is the book of the law. And the people of God seem to have lost the law of God. They they misplaced their Bible, so to speak, for years. So much so that when Josiah hears it, he says that this is the law of God. And he tears his clothes, recognizing for all these years The people of God had been living in a fashion which was totally against his law because they lost it. The people of God, who are supposed to be about the Word of God, had just lost it. They'd misplaced their Bible. And just in case you're smirking, thinking, how can the Israelites have been so stupid? You know, when you look at the history of the church, the whole reason the Reformation happened, or, or it's be beginning to happen in the 13th, 14th, 15th century, is the people of God, once again, seemed to have lost the Word of God and ended up with a gospel that was nothing like the gospel in the Word of God itself. There's this propensity within the people of God to forget or misplace or replace God's Word. So there's these wonderful promises that are given to the people of God of encouragement and the fact that He won't leave them or forsake them. The law is written down and given to them, and it will be read to them, all of them, every seven years to encourage them to walk in the, in the things of God at least every seven years. And then we get to this verse, which so far you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm holding these parts together until that is, you get to verse 17. Now, this is where Joshua and Moses are in the presence of God, and God is speaking, and he says this in verse 17 about the people of Israel. Then in my anger, then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them and they will be devoured. And you're thinking, hang on a minute. If I go back to verse 6, God said to the people of Israel, do not fear or be in dread of them, for there's Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. He said, I will not leave you or forsake you. And then in verse 17, he says, I will forsake them. Even er he says to, to Joshua, I will not leave you or forsake you. And yet here again, he's saying, I will forsake you. My face, I will hide from them. And you think, well, which is it? Is it a case of God is promising he will not leave them or forsake them, which is really encouraging and really good? Or is he saying, I will forsake you. I will hide my face from you. We, we have these two apparently contradictory statements, and it's not like they're in different books of the Bible. It's not like they're in different chapters. They're within a stone's throw of one another. On the one hand, God's saying to his people, you're going into the land and I will will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And on the other hand, I will forsake you. And I will hide my face from you. And there's this question of, well, well, which one is it? Which one of the promises are we supposed to cling to that God will forsake us or he will never leave or forsake us. I mean, which one actually is it? Now, in a bid to to answer that question, God gifts us something. So, So we could just treat this a bit like pick and mix. Which one do you like? 
and leave the one you don't. I'm assuming we're all going to go for um, verse 6. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. I am with you. I I won't leave you or forsake you. I'm assuming we'd probably all pick that one. Or or maybe verse 8 there when it's directed towards Joshua. Those would be the ones we would pick. And the one we would leave would be verse 17. But we're not supposed to treat Scripture like pick and mix. That's not how it's designed to work. And when we find instances like this where where verses seem complicated to hold together, we're supposed to pay closer attention to the text. Because what happens next is God gifts something to Israel. And it's surprising initially because you read this in verse 19. Therefore, so we've got this confusion. He's going to be with them, and he won't leave them or forsake them. And then he says, I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them. So, so we have this confusion, and so verse 19 says, therefore, write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. So, in order to help us with this confusion, God gifts to us a song. He gifts to Israel a song. So, Moses is given this song by God, and what we read later down here in verse 22, so Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. And so, so Moses is gifted this song by God, He writes it down, and he teaches it to the people of Israel. But here's the big picture. This is how it's supposed to work. When Israel gets into the land, they have the law that will be read to them every seven years. They have the promise of God that he will go with them. He's not going to leave them or forsake them. And they've been gifted this song. And what God says is once they get into the land, they are going to become prosperous. And they're going to prosper and have lots of of food and drink and land and animals, you know, that they're just going to be overwhelmed with the goodness of God. And what God says is going to happen is this. They're going to eat and drink. They're going to enjoy their prosperity. And they're going to forget about God. They're going to rebel against God. They're going to break His covenant and go after other gods. God's suggesting that their prosperity is actually going to lead to their downfall. So the more they get, the further they're going to get from God, break His covenants, and go after other gods. But then the song is going to come into play. Because everyone is going to know this song, and it sounds like God is going to do something almost supernatural of sorts, where this song is going to stick in the minds of the children. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation, I know you have, where um, you won't be thinking of anything, and then somebody will start singing a song or humming a tune. And then for the rest of the day, you cannot get that song or that tune out of your head. It's just stuck in there. Well, what God is saying here is, once His people rebel, break His covenant, and go after other gods, this song is going to be in the minds of their children. And the children are going to be singing this song whilst the parents are rebelling against God and breaking His covenants. And it's going to be in the minds of the children who are going to be singing the song. And it's going to bring God willing conviction to the adults or judgment. But it will rise up as a witness against them. So we're, we're gifted this song. And the beautiful thing is we're given all the words of it. Deuteronomy 32 is about one thing. It's that song that God gave to Moses that Moses wrote down and taught to the people of Israel. So here is a God-breathed song from Deuteronomy 32, verse 1 to the end of verse 43. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend our time, the little bit of time we've got left, thinking about this song and trying to figure out won't forsake you, won't leave you, will forsake you, will hide my face from you. This song is answering 
that question, that problem for us. The song breaks down into, into four parts, but first of all, it begins with these two images. The first one is the image of a courtroom where God calls heaven and earth as witnesses against his own people. So God is speaking in this courtroom, and he says, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. So he's calling the heavens and the earth as witnesses to pay attention to what he's saying. And straight away you're presented with this idea that all of creation is perfectly obedient to God. He can call the heavens and the earth to be his witnesses. The only part of creation, it seems, which is rebelling against God is that part of creation made in his own image after his own likeness. And in particular, his own children are most rebellious of all. The heavens and the earth are called as witnesses. And yet the second image that this song opens with isn't just a courtroom, it's a rain shower. This one speaks of judgment, but the rain shower, it's not a rain storm that would blow things away. Instead, it's like the heavenly dew coming down upon the earth. And the hope is that as the rains fall upon the ground, like God's Word falling upon the heart, that the heavenly dew, the rain, will soften the ground, encouraging growth that the ground may bear fruit. And the hope of this song is that as the words of God fall upon receptive hearts, they may soften and bear fruit in keeping with righteousness. So you have an image of judgment, and you have this hope of, of growth in the knowledge of who God is. And then the song begins. And the very first part of the song is about one thing. And this is verse 3 and verse 4, and it's dealing with this one topic, the character of God. It's God who is presented before us in this particular section. This week in the New City Catechism, we're looking at the question, what is God? And then we've, we've got that paragraph describing what is God, what it means for God to be God. Here Moses is giving his answer to that question, what is God? He says this in verse 3, I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. Moses is saying, when, when you stop and think about it, God is great. God is perfect. God is justice. God is faithfulness. God is without iniquity. God is just, and God is upright. In actual fact, Moses is saying, he's a rock. He's immovable, unchangeable. This is our God. One of the things that the Wesleys figured out, one of the reasons they wrote so many hymns is that the majority of God's people learn their theology, their understanding of who God is, not from the Scriptures. It's strange, but it's true. People learn their theology from the songs that they sing. So often Christians will quote songs or hymns rather than Scripture. What you have in this song here is a God-breathed song. And what it's telling you primarily, indeed you could argue the whole of this song is about one thing, the character of God. And what Moses is saying here is, our God is immovable. He is a rock. Everything else may be fluid and changing, but not God. He's perfect. He's great. He's faithful unchanging like a humongous rock that nothing can shift. This is our God. And that's how he opens up this hymn, this song. The next section moves over to 
and this is from verse 5 down to the end of verse 14, and it's making one point clear. God is kind. It's speaking about the kindness of God towards mankind in general, and specifically towards His own people. There's this beautiful truth that erupts here from verse 6, where the question is presented in, in regard to the kindness of God. Is He not your Father who created you, who made you and established you? Well, what this verse is, is making absolutely clear is, hear this, you were not a mistake. You may think, well, I'm not sure my mom or my dad wanted you. I can't answer that particular question for you. What I can say from this verse is, irrespective of the will of your parents, God did. God created you and formed you and knit you together in your mother's womb. And in that sense, you were definitely not an accident or a mistake. And it goes even further than just that. You're exactly the way that God wanted you to be. You're the height He wanted you to be. And what also erupts from this song is not only that, you were even born in the place that God wanted you to be born in. I mean, it's the kindness of God to some is just amazing. I mean, some of us actually got to be born in a place called Wick. Others of you were born in lesser places, but you were born exactly where God wanted you to be born. Such is the kindness of our God. He desired your presence on the face of this earth. He even created the boundaries where you would be born. And the kindness of God towards His creation erupts from this part of this hymn. But in particular, it focuses in upon His own people. And he speaks about them here, his heritage, as literally the end of verse 10, as the apple of his eye. We, we've all come across those instances where you see parents with their children, and you can just see how much affection and love is flowing from the parent toward the child, and you just know that this child is the apple of their eye. And what God is saying to His people is, that's what you are to me. You are the apple of my eye. Let, let me read to you the whole of verse 10. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. And he kept him as the apple of his eye. And then you've got this notion of God just wrapping His arms around His child, His people, and caring for them, and, and protecting them, and loving them, and just the affection of God toward His children. And it's just a, a wonderful image, but it's the image in the next verse which takes it to a whole new level, where it's, it's the image of an eagle guarding its nest with the eaglets within it. And yet the eagle is not content just to have the, the eaglet safe in the nest. That's not enough. No, the eagle begins to stir up the nest to get the eaglets to, to come out of the nest. He's not content for them just to, to remain in the nest in perpetual eagle immaturity, so to speak. No, he, he wants these eaglets to, to grow and develop so the nest is being stirred up. And the eaglets are being forced out of the nest. And what, what he's longing for here is the growth of his children. Until finally the, the wings of the eaglets are being spread out. And yes, they may fall. But here the eagle is going to catch them and bear them up and, and allow them again to grow. And what we see here in the kindness of God is that he wants his children to grow he wants, metaphorically speaking, for them to rise up on wings like eagles and soar in the midst of His creation. He's not longing for His children to be scraping around in the mud and the dirt and going after other things like other idols and other gods and being weighed down in the midst of sin. He wants them to rise up and grow. And Christian, God's heart towards you is kind. His heart towards you is overflowing with love. 
You're the apple of his eye. He has surrounded you. He's taken you from the wilderness. He's brought you to himself. He has cared for you, protected you, but he wants you to grow. And he's not content to leave you in the comfort of a nest. He wants you to grow more and more into the very image of his son we learn in the New Testament pages. That's the second stanza, as it were, of this hymn about the kindness of our God. The next section, though, from verse 15 down to the end of verse 25, it brings out something else. A a topic, a subject that we're not, not quite so comfortable with, and that's putting it mildly. What it brings out is the faithfulness of God in disciplining his children. Like I said, it seems that the only part of creation that is not obedient to God is that part made in his image after his likeness, and in particular, his own children who've been gifted his word. So, they're without excuse. They've been given the law, and yet they seem to be rebelling. Look at verse 18. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. It's not just that they're forgetting the law and misplacing it. They actually forget God. They're they're unmindful of the rock that Moses spoke about in verse 4. They've just forgotten all about God. And what he said is as they're running after other gods and abandoning him, he will discipline them. As far as they're concerned, it will appear that God has forsaken them and hidden His face from them, distancing Himself from them. Listen to what he says, verse 23. I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. I will send the teeth of beasts against them and the venom of things that crawl in the dust. Outdoors the the sword shall bereave and indoors terror for young man and woman alike, for the nursing child with the man of gray hairs. And God is saying, I'm going to come after them and they will know my displeasure because they have abandoned me. God's discipline will be known among them them. However, he promises it's going to be limited. He's not going to completely eradicate them. They may even lose the land according to his discipline, but they will never be removed from off the face of the earth. What we're learning from this song is a right understanding of God recognizes the greatness of God, It recognizes the kindness of God, but what it must also include is that this God will discipline His children. They they will know His discipline. And if you want to be convinced of that in a less poetic fashion than this song is, is making clear, then all you need to do is turn to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament And verse 3, and I'll just read in for a few verses where it says this. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. The the point that the writer of Hebrews is making is, Because God loves us as His children, He will discipline us. And no discipline seems pleasant at the time. And you may remember times in your childhood where you questioned whether your parent even loved you at all. It's like the loving heart of your parent had been removed, and all that was left was this disciplining person. But now when you look back, I trust, you can see that The discipline which was painful at that time 
was actually done from a place of love. And it seemed to be that the, the face of your father was hidden from you and something else was present. But in actual fact, the face of the father was there all along, doing what a loving father is called to do and discipline his children that they may flourish and grow as the early part of this hymn actually wanted them to. But like I said, the discipline of God is limited. And it's not limited on account of my goodness. So somehow or other, Kenny Ross fits into God's grand scheme and overarching plan. That's not it at all. It's limited because what's made clear in verse 27 is that the enemies of God, if He eradicated His children in discipline, they would look in and mock God. So for God's name's sake, the discipline is limited and measured. But when He turns His attention towards His adversaries, to those who are not His children, to those outside of His kingdom. Well, that's what this last part of the song from verse 26 down to the end of verse 43 is all about. God will have vengeance against His adversaries. It's not a, a pleasant thought in any way, shape, or form, but listen to this, verse 35. Vengeance is mine, and recompense. For the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. Or what about this? And we'll come back to these verses in closing in just a moment. Verse 39. See now that I, even I am He, and there is no God beside me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and swear as I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries. I will pay, repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired heads of the enemy. You know what is true? You could not read this song. That There's no way you could read this song and arrive at a place where you say, God will not move in judgment. There is no way you could read this song and say, God will not have vengeance upon those who have ignored Him and rebelled against Him. There is no way you could read this song and just say, God's going to go, it's okay. Everybody can come into heaven. You cannot arrive at that understanding from this song that was given to Moses by God to be taught to the people that they would learn to fear this God and who He actually is. Despite that fact, many people present a God who is nothing like the one presented in this hymn. A God with no judgment, no anger against sin, and no desire to do justice. Exactly the opposite of the God who is presented in this hymn that was gifted to Moses. The God of the Bible has not changed. Judgment is coming when God's vengeance on account of the laws that have been broken will be enacted against those who are outside of His people and His children. They will suffer punishment. This unchanging God who is perfect, deserving that greatness be ascribed to Him, who is just and is justice, He will bring judgment. And yet, we who deserve to be forsaken, we won't be, because it's not actually about us. It's about His name. There's only ever been one person 
who grew up before God like a tender shoot out of dry ground, and he flourished in the presence of God, and he had the law of God and all his life he obeyed the laws of God, which meant at no point whatsoever did he ever deserve to be forsaken because he was doing the law of God, which meant that by the promise of God, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, that was his portion. And yet that one person of whom I'm speaking cried out just outside of Jerusalem when he was hanging on a cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He never should have been forsaken, and yet he knew what it was to be forsaken by God. Why? Because our judgment, our forsakenness, was taken by him, and his portion through faith is gifted to us, so that what we have now is the sure and certain promise of God. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, because Christ has dealt with it all for us. You know, when you read this hymn, with that understanding. You hear these words again, God saying, I kill and I will make alive. Christ was killed and Christ was raised from the dead by God. When he was on the cross crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Others around about it said, he's calling for Elijah to come and deliver him. And you know what this hymn says though? There is none that can deliver out of my hand when judgment has taken hold. What this hymn also speaks about is God taking his flashing sword, his his flaming sword of justice, and that was extinguished in the person of Jesus Christ. And the way that this hymn ends is a bit like this, or it's exactly like this. Rejoice with him, O heavens. Bow down to him, all gods. It finishes with this triumphant note of this one who has endured these things for the very heavens to worship him. Do you remember that psalm when it says, who is this that's approaching? Oh, gates, lift up your heads. Do you remember in the throne room of heaven, who is found to be worthy? And the answer is the one who was like a lamb who was slain, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has done everything to take the judgment and the punishment of God that all who have faith may go free and never know what it means to be forsaken by God. Your loved ones, would you rather they knew what it was for God to say to them, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you? Or would you rather they knew what it was to be forsaken for all of eternity? Pretty sure I know the answer to that question. And that brings me back to our calling. Our calling is a simple one. Our calling is to make known what Christ has done to secure for us a promise that we will never be forsaken and that God will never leave us, to spread that message far and wide, because God has not changed. Judgment is coming, and the only way to avoid it is to know Christ through faith. This hymn, if only the truths of it were known across the length and breadth of our land, that men and women might come to a saving knowledge of our Savior and our Redeemer. This is the hymn that was taught to the people of God beside the law, that they might know him, that it would soften their hearts and bear fruit. And I pray with us that as we've spent time looking at this hymn, that it may be like the dew of heaven falling upon our heart, and that the fruit that is born is that we might be men and women who are proclaiming the good news of Jesus, that others may be saved through him. Let me pray for us in closing. 
Father, we thank you for your word, but we thank you in particular for the gift of this hymn, for the truths that erupt from it, from you, our great God, the rock, the faithful one, the just one, the perfect one, the one who is without iniquity, the one who does uprightness. Father, we thank you for the way that it displays your heart to us of kindness and love and mercy and a desire that we grow, and yet how it portrays you also as our loving Father who will bring discipline when it is needed, that we might grow and flourish in what you have for us. I thank you that you want none of us to waste our lives, but you want us to grow in the things concerning you. And yet, Father, the warning in here that a day is coming when books will be opened and judgment will be unleashed, and yet the hope of a Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, the calling upon us to make Him known. Oh, Father, as we sang recently, may your church rise up. May she become a witnessing, proclaiming church telling others about the somebody who has done everything that we may be saved. Help us in this. Empower us in this. In his name we ask. Amen. As always, we'll put a hymn up here in the corner and invite you to join with us in worshiping our God via this hymn. Thank you. <laughs>